Hello everyone, Ken here, back with another video where I review your projects, resumes, portfolios, and now sometimes LinkedIn profiles. In this video, I'm reviewing Francis's work. Francis is from Nigeria, and I think it's absolutely incredible that I have subscribers and people submitting their work from around the world, really. I will kind of hazard you guys or, or warn you guys that my expertise is really only focused on the US. So definitely take anything that I say about the positions with a grain of salt when it's relating to your own country and the practices they use there. There's still definitely different cultural, uh, you know, cultural differences when evaluating candidates uh, across different countries, uh, across the world, even in different states in the US. So again, just take what I'm saying with a little bit of a grain of salt here. Today, for Francis's work, I'm really gonna focus down on just one or two of his projects. I'm not gonna be doing as much with the GitHub profile or a resume or anything like that. We're gonna to get to the nitty gritty of how we can improve the specific projects that he's worked on. So I think that this will be fun, especially for people more on the beginner level to understand, okay, what makes a good project? How do I build out and continue to expand my portfolio through things like this? So I hope that you find it interesting and let's just jump right into this here. So this is Francis's profile, great picture, good, um, good description of himself. Also, it would be cool if he put his LinkedIn link here. That's really the only feedback I have on that side. Of course, we want to pin the projects we want people to see first or potentially do one of those, uh, one of the headers for the GitHub repos that I'm going to have done before this video is published. So I think it was, it was Boris that said he was going to hold me accountable for that as one of my subscribers. So we'll see if I do it before tomorrow morning. Let's look at his Francis's biggest project here, which is predicting life expectancy. So if we look at the readme, the readme is non-existent. So I would definitely recommend that he go through and follow some of the steps for making a good readme. I think I do that pretty well in my project from scratch series. So I'll link the video of how to build out a readme to you know either above or below in the description or, or pinned comment. But let's jump into the code here for the most part. So he does, uh, Francis does a really good job of commenting his code using plain text here. Uh, there are just a couple things that I really want to point out. So the first thing is the aim you know, he has some case mismatch here. If that's the first thing you see, um, you probably want to adjust to make sure your spelling and casing is correct. He goes through and does, you know, pulls in the data. Um, it's from the World Health Organization, but I'd love to know more about where he got it. So maybe when he's talking about the data, he talk, you should talk a little bit about a link to where he got it from. Those things are, are pretty important to data scientists. He loads in the data, he, does a little bit of correction of some of the you know different countries that are in here that didn't match up just some light data cleaning feature engineering that's generally what we expect i'm going to gloss over this just a little bit more here um, and then he cleans up the headers which is definitely a good practice especially if you're going to be going through this uh, and experimenting along the way he uses pandas profiling here and the data professor has a good video on how that works Basically, it really can streamline your EDA quite a bit. It's, it's a good tool, but I think it still makes sense for you to go through and show, especially when you're thinking of employers, that you can do a lot of this uh, analysis yourself. So, he, you know, he says the easy way and the hard way, and I, I think that's perfectly, perfectly fine. He also does what I always recommend. He does .info and .describe to understand some of the trends within the data at a high level. One thing that I've been fooling around with is visualizing this chart um, that's something that you can do fairly easily uh, you just take each of the rows and you visualize them either in a bar chart a histogram whatever that might be he also looks at the nulls and we can see that population has quite a few nulls so does gdp and uh, life expectancy his his target variable or his dependent variable also has some so he's gonna have to figure out how to uh, how to manage those. So it looks like that is his next step, uh, as, as a matter of fact. And he goes through and looks specifically where those are taking place. Something that he could do at the end is try and predict the ones where, where they had null values. 
uh, from the, the current data that he has. That could be an interesting way to explore further after he's built a model for, these, for this analysis. So he goes through and removes some of the super highly correlated stuff, I believe. And then he gets into some of the exploratory analysis. So this is, this is a nice looking core plot. I would like to see a legend on here um, because you know it look, I'd have to study and say okay green means um, green means strongly positively dark blue is or like very dark blue is negatively uh, correlated also we're used to seeing core plots in you know negative one to positive one so I think it's an interesting choice that he went with you know multiplying it by 100 here I don't think that that's a necessary uh, a necessary stop for this. So definitely make sure you have your legend. This is totally fine. It's just kind of semantics, uh, some small things here. I also like how we made these into functions, so they're reproducible. So we could do this for Nigeria. He could do it for a bunch of different countries. I think that that's a nice touch that I really like to see. You want your code to be uh, reproducible, and when you use functions in a workbook like this, that's that's a very good sign for potential employers. Next, we have something similar. We have a plot over time of GDP, or I believe you could put in really any variable here. I think that, again, building a bit of a framework to show some graphs or to present your data in a more producible, reproducible or experimental way is a very strong thing. So, you know, this graph is interesting. Since he's doing the exploratory analysis and he's from Nigeria, it'd be interesting to know what happened from 2014 to 2015, for example. Um, I think that that would be a, an interesting context you can add because of your unique position living there. You could say what happened with the government or whatever that might have been. Um, he's also looking at life expectancy based on continents. And so it looks like Europeans actually live the longest, which is interesting. Um, and by country status, so developed and developing, and then we're also looking at uh, the count there. So this is all very good um, and useful stuff as we're thinking about, okay, how are we going to predict this life expectancy? Um, he could have done a loop where he just went through and looked at life expectancy for each of the columns, for example, and did a bunch of pivot tables. Uh, I think that that's also a good practice. It would have saved him from doing each one of these. He could have kind of done it in bulk, uh, but the way he's done it is is perfectly fine. Um, I again like the pivot tables a bit more than group by for some of this stuff. It just is a little bit easier to use in my personal opinion. So again, he has some cool line charts. He shows, I mean, Africa is showing really strong growth in life expectancy over time. It would have been cool maybe for him to do um, the, instead of just one model, multiple models to predict a, a life expectancy for each different uh, continent. Or he could have done, uh, tried to understand what the slope of each of these lines looks like uh, as another side project or another exploration. So the outlier detection is also pretty cool. We see some strong outliers in quite a few countries. If you're going to go down the outlier route and plot all of these, it might be worth pulling one out from each one and looking at why it is such an outlier. For example, this alcohol one is very interesting to me. I'd like to know what country that is or the hepatitis one or something like that. Uh, that would be a very uh, fascinating add on that gives more context and makes things interesting. I think when you're doing exploratory analysis, it's very cool to do you know, you're, you're creating the graphs, you're looking at the trends, but you're also doing a case study approach. You're trying to make it interesting for the viewer. So you're pulling out specific things that are, are weird or unique and you're trying to explain them further. So I definitely think that pulling out maybe a few of these outliers would be worth, uh, would be worth pursuing. He goes through and he, he, he looks at the, uh, the outliers from a specific, um, from each of the specific features which I think is a good practice. Um, right here, he goes through and uses Windsorization. I actually wasn't super familiar with Windsorization. That's really why I enjoy doing these things. I learn something new every day. Uh, so I had to go back and review. And so Windsorization is rather than removing the outliers, you're reducing their weights in, in, the, in the data that you're using. 
so they just count for less which I think is, is pretty cool, it's a fascinating technique. I'd like for him to explain a bit more why he chose that approach. Uh, next, he normalizes the data. I'd also like for him to explain why he normalized it. I mean, in something like this, if you're building just a basic regression, you don't really, you don't really need to. Um, but again, I think it's, uh, it's a good practice to normalize in general. So the last thing that we're gonna look at is, oh, um, you know, he went through and did all the, uh, the box plots. Instead of doing this, he could have probably done a histogram. Um, and we could have seen the, how many were, were kind of on the tails rather than looking at it in text. So a histogram, there's, there's value in, um, in that as well and visualizing the outliers that way. So let's keep going. So here he actually builds builds this linear model. We're looking at the shape of the life expectancy and the prediction losses. So uh, again, a very simple model, but this is more about understanding the data than truly predicting the outcomes. As I'd mentioned before, he could go through and take some of the other, um, the other data points, the other countries that did not have values for life expectancy and try and predict them here. I think that would tell a good story. I would also like to see him explain more about what the coefficients mean. So alcohol to me, I'm surprised that that is uh, positively correlated or that it has a positive coefficient um, because you think companies that, um, you know, probably more alcohol isn't good for your health, but then you hear about the wine studies and you're like, well, developed countries are probably more inclined to drink more. so. Um, going into a couple of these and understanding, you know, maybe some misconceptions about them or talking through why you would expect they're in a certain way, uh, that would be really interesting. Um, but maybe I'd also like to see some VIF statistics because we don't know what is super correlated with what here. I mean, he obviously went through it in the core plot, but we don't know if there's too much multicollinearity. Again, for example, alcohol might be super highly correlated with a developed country. Um, we, what he also could do is use some regularization instead, which would be, I think, a reasonable approach to take as well. So I liked this project. I think the data was a little bit uh, basic. I've seen other people use the World Health Organization, but I think that this analysis, again, was, was pretty cool. It was, it was in-depth enough that I would look at this project and be like, okay, um, you know, I, I would count it in his portfolio and, and he showed a lot of relevant skills. I mean, even I had to look up what Windsorization is uh, and a couple of other different things. The next project he did, I really like, and I thought that this was super unique. He took all of his WhatsApp data with his girlfriend and he actually analyzed it. So this is something that, you know, if I was him, this is the project I would highlight as long as it doesn't get too personal with the information that he's giving. Um, I'd also like to understand better how he uh, how he got the data from WhatsApp. I mean, did he download it? Did he use their API? What does that look like? Um, but, you know, this was a very good clean analysis as well. He removes all the stop words. He builds a, a word cloud. You know, if he wanted to, he could have uh, used a mask and put the words in his picture with his girlfriend as an overlay. I think I have a video, uh, I'll link it, that, that I do that. Um, that's always a fun project, but I think that that always looks really cool. So he goes through and his name is Francis and um, his username is, was, I think, Phoenix. So that, that's going to appear quite a bit. Uh, but there's a couple really interesting things that he took out of this. I mean, here he's using this case study approach like I talked about. He's like, oh, these are the messages where it was longer or shorter or whatever that might be. Uh, that's, in my opinion, again, a, a good example of a... Um, a case study analysis. But here, here's where I think it really starts to get interesting. So he, he analyzes how, how many messages each of them have sent. Um, he does, you know, when people have sent more messages uh, at, at night or in the morning, time of day between the two of them. So it looks like they're both, um, they're both more PM, PM texters. And then the lengths of the messages, I mean, um, I think if you had this information for everyone, you could probably see which relationships were gonna last and which ones wouldn't. Or you could learn about people's textile and how they message and how they respond. Um, 
and having data for a lot of people on this would be absolutely fascinating to me. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that this is so unique because he's doing this to better understand his relationship with his girlfriend. Um, and that's a, a personal question where you're collecting your own data, you're better understanding it. And he came to some, some pretty cool insights here. So, I mean, the, the, the word cloud is interesting, but again, the meat of this is where he's looking at the lengths and where they respond. And, um, you know, I don't know if he has the average, the average length of each of their messages, but, you know, maybe she messages him less, but her messages are longer uh, or something like that. So again, a really cool analysis by Francis. I, I appreciate him sending this in and, you know, hopefully he doesn't mind. I, I don't think I shared too much of his personal text history on here. Uh, but hopefully this is also useful to you when you're thinking about your own projects. Um, just a couple of the small, uh, the small tweaks that you can make to really make them pop to employers, to make them tell a better story, to make them more interesting to anyone who's watching. So as usual, good luck on your data science journey.